something? Yeah. yeah. It's like people with some anxiety. <laughs> really? It would be, yeah. Why? It's what just a, look, it's just a little it's microphone. Just a little microphone. Okay. Like, no worries. It's yeah, just I mean, a little microphone. Yeah, I'm just a bigger microphone. microphone. I'd be scared. Yeah. I actually don't know how yeah. to use it. Oh, okay. Leo might. Even better. We just, I'll just talk really loud. I mean, I think I can just talk really loud. Whoa. <laughs> oh, we're not going to be on the stage. It's a tiny little stage. all so much for being here and welcome to the fifth fifth annual western mass youth climate summit my name is Brittany, and i'm the climate education coordinator here at arcadia which is a almost 400 acre sanctuary um, and diverse habitats trails everywhere so come back and explore when you have the chance um, Mass Audubon runs Arcadia as well as a whole bunch of other sanctuaries and they hold about 40,000 acres across the state in order to protect them and to preserve that land for people and for wildlife and also to help with climate change. And so we're so glad that you're here today and I'm so pleased to be working with partners again and they'll introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Colleen Kelly. I'm also another one of the leaders for the Climate Summit. have been working in partners with Audubon for the last five years to run these. Um, Hitchcock Center, which I have way under all these layers. Um, Hitchcock Center for the Environment is an a environmental center that's over in Amherst, Massachusetts, right near Hampshire College, on the, almost on the Hampshire College campus there. And uh, we are a living building, 20, 23rd uh, worldwide living building and that means that we have systems at our building that are modeling to the community about positive solutions to climate change. So we have water collecting on our roof, we have composting toilets, we have non-toxic um, materials to build our building. Um, and it's just a wonderful, it's set up so that you can go there and visit and you can see all these things happening and we're hoping that communities can begin integrating these into their communities for um, positive solutions for climate change. So please come visit us there also and we have great trails and a lot of programs going on there. Um, and I hope you have a great day today. We have great weather on our side and it's, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thanks. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the 2021 Youth Climate Summit. <laughs> um, my name's Sasha, I'm from Northfield Mount Hermon, and um, just so you know, I just want to remind everyone that you should have your masks over your mouth and your nose at all times, unless you're eating or drinking. Also, as another reminder, if you want to use the bathroom, just go into the visitor center, you go directly to the right and there's a bathroom labeled women's room, but don't worry, it's unisex, anyone can use it, but only two people in the bathroom per time um, at the most. And Brittany, do you have an announcement about the bathrooms? <laughs> yeah, it's that old environmental adage. Um, if it's yellow, let it mellow, please. We're trying to save water and also our septic can't take it. Thank you. <laughs> so we want to do a little icebreaker to introduce the teams. So in your team, if you want to um, choose a mascot, an animal mascot, um, just like take a few minutes to decide your mascot and then we're gonna introduce each team with the school and your mascot that you chose. Okay. <laughs> Make the mascot different than your school's mascot. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And then we have those glasses. You'll say, we're going to do two sides. We're going to just hold on here. Okay, so I'll be the last. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then you also have to say the final one. Unless you want to see the last one. Oh, yeah. And then you say the last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello? <laughs> Hi yeah. everyone. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Hello? <laughs> okay, that was really good. Okay, so we're gonna introduce ourselves first. So we're the planning team. My name's Vicky and um my pronouns are she, her, and I've been on the planning team for about two years. Hello everyone, I've never used a microphone before, this is scary. Um, so, I am Ollie, uh, my pronouns are she, her. I've been on the playing team for about three years now, and I'm so excited to start the day with you all. We gotta go under the um, I'm too short. My Mor I'm Morgan, my pronouns are they, them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've been on the planning team for about a year now, so, yeah. Hi, y'all. I'm Natalia, pronouns she, hers, and uh, this is my first year on the planning team. Hello, my name's uh, Leo Franceschi, I use he, him pronouns, and I've been on the planning team for uh, two and a half years. Hi, my name is Sasha. I use she, her pronouns, and this is my first year on the planning team. And now we're going to go around one by one and share our mascots, but um, we're going to have one representative from each group share the school name and the mascot. And we'll start with the planning team. <laughs> all right. Hi, all. Back again. So um, we are the planning team platypi. Some really cool three facts about platypus or platypi. Um, one, they are the only mammal to lay eggs. Two, they have a sixth sense that is like echolocation, but using electricity. Not 100% sure how it works, but look it up, it's really cool. And the third thing is that they have poisonous claws. So yeah, cool animal. Oh yes. So each team have one person. Please come up to the microphone and tell us what your animal is. Yes, public speaking. Well, you can adjust it however you want. Here you go. Okay. Hi everyone. We are over there and we are the East Hampshire Regional Rabid Raccoons. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, we're that table, we're in Northampton High School, and we're the Dragonflies. Hi, uh, we're at this table over here, and we're the Northfield Mount Hermon Pandas. Hi, we're that table over there, I represent Suffield High School, we represent Suffield High School. We're the uh, Myceliums, um, which is the strand that, strands that live underground and connect trees so that they communicate. And I thought that was really symbolic for why we're all here. Um, okay. Hi, our table's over there. We're uh, Hampshire Regional West, and our mascot is the Velociraptor. Okay, uh, hi, this is our table. Uh, Frontier Regional High School, and we represent like the porcupine. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm from uh, P Pittsfield High School, where the table over here, and our mascot is the honey badger. And hello again, not a, not a mascot, but just want to introduce two uh, people that are here that. Um, I would like to have introductions for. Uh, director from the Hitchcock Center, uh, Billy Spitzer, is over here in the corner, waving over there. 
And then we have a very important person to honor, the person who brought us the idea of doing a climate summit from the Wild Center. He visited and saw a youth presenting and said this is one of the coolest things he had ever seen and so powerful. And he came to Audubon, he came to Hitchcock Center and said, let's do that. That's John Green. Okay. So thank you, John. We always like John. Great. All right, y'all. Thank you much for being, for being here. So before we get started, we're going to do a quick little game. Um, this game doesn't actually have a name, but we're going to call it Guess My Number. So to start off, each table is going to have a number. This will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Feel free to ask because you know, it's kind of weird. Anyway, so everyone is going to pick a number between one and seven in their head. Please don't tell anyone what your number is. Then we're all going to stand up. And without talking, you're going to try to convey what your number is by the amount of hops you do. So if I was two, I could do like this. And you're going to try to find all the people with the same number and convene at your table. So if you're a two, all the twos will meet here all the threes will meet here, et cetera, et cetera. And we're gonna be trying to get as accurate as possible. Your goal is that your team has everyone who has your same number. And yeah. So we're gonna start with hopping, and then we're gonna to try to communicate through some other fun ways. So does everyone have a number in their head? Cool. Please stand up. A reminder, you are not allowed to communicate your number in any other form than hopping. Have at it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Are they going to be new tables? Like, do I get to move all my stuff out? No, this is just for that. Okay. Okay. Six, 
Now she got artistic. Seventh. That's so sad. Beautiful. Ah, that worked really well. Good job. Awesome. So, good news. This was just a practice round. <laughs> yes. Our next round is going to be out in the field. You do not have assigned tables. So you are just going to try, have to try to find your people and make a clump and get everyone in there. Except this time you're not communicated through hopping, you're communicated through squatting. And if you <laughs> have at it, I would also please go to the field. Thank you. Yes, yes change your numbers. So that was a very important thing I forgot to include. I should like interview. I'm not. Oh, to your original tables with your school. Thank you. Uh, yeah.
Hello. I'm here. Hello, hello. We all listening? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm here to do a land acknowledgement. Um, we just wanted to begin today by acknowledging the Pocumtuck, Nipmuc, and Mohican peoples who lived and still live on this land where we are gathered. While we stand together in this place, we must acknowledge the importance of understanding the long-standing history that has brought us to reside on this land where our feet now rest, and to seek to understand our place within that history. It's important to remember that indigenous peoples are not just a people of the past, but that of the past, present, and future. Please join us in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and to remember how, consider how we can each in our own way try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you. Okay, and now I will pass it to Ollie for a quick presentation. All right, so I got a bit of a longer presentation, so I'm gonna try without my mask. Can you all hear me okay? I can move the mic closer to you. I was gonna try to not Oh, do it without the mic? The mic? Yeah. Oh, yeah, just for now. Okay, so hello everyone. As I said before, my name is Ollie. I use she, her pronouns. I've been on the planning team for about three years now. And I'm so excited to start our summit today with you all. But before we begin, we first need to know why we are here. So as some of you probably know, every year our planning team hosts an annual climate summit where several change maker teams, such as yourselves, come to learn how to put together a, a CAP to bring back to their schools. So a CAP stands for a climate action project or plan. And this CAP will help guide your team throughout the school year um, so the main point of these projects is to start implementing changes to make our communities more sustainable and environmentally friendly, as well as spread awareness about the issues we are facing today. So some examples of successful climate action plans from years prior include replacing the lights in school hallways and bathrooms with something more environmentally friendly, um, or organizing a group of students to plant, um, to plant trees around school grounds, or um, making the school cafeteria more environmentally friendly by implementing a recycling or composting system. Um, you could also start by selling water bottles or reusable straws or reusable bags for, um, to other students to raise money for your projects. Um, but we also, start, uh, we also need to start thinking bigger. So we've been talking about these little steps that we can each individually take, like turning off the lights and reduce, reuse, recycle, for, oh, and eating local for a long time. Um, other bigger picture climate action plans that your group can start thinking about are planning school strikes or encouraging your school to install solar panels or even hosting events such as other climate summits or wide awakes to encourage more open conversations between students and teachers alike about climate education and environmental justice. Um, this year the summit's theme centers around creative climate action. Um, a major theme throughout our work has always been to keep, keep keep climate action accessible and our projects unique to youth experience. Um, and we've been doing this in several different ways over the past few years, including um, trying to keep events engaging and interactive through artistic expression. Um, and we have found that this is an essential aspect of youth-led activism, especially in time of virtual education. So to help create your climate action plans, um, each team has been given an organization worksheet, which you'll find on your table. Um, and yeah, I think everyone has a worksheet. You wanna just look in the little box on your table. And so, yeah, you can just get this prepared for um, when we have our small group discussions at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, we just wanna go through this worksheet really quick um, because as we hear from our wonderful lineup of speakers and artists, um, we want you all to start thinking about how your team can utilize art in your climate action plans. So the first thing you're going to do when you sit down at the end of the day is choose the main focus of your climate action plan. And on the very first page, um, we've listed some examples of possible focuses your team could choose as well. Um, so the question we want you all to keep in mind while hearing introductions from speakers is, how is art connected to environmental, ev environmental justice and advocacy? Um, how is art connected to a technological or nature-based solution? 
Um, how can you get creative in your plans to communicate the urgency of climate change to the rest of your school? And then the second step is going to be pinpointing the exact issues that your project will be addressing. Um, so to help with this, we um, have also provided a community mapping tool, which you'll also find in your box. Um, and this tool can help you um, just pinpoint the exact issues in your community that need to be addressed first. Um, and then after you've looked at that worksheet, um, or that tool, you're going to set some concrete goals to work toward. And after that, you're going to lay out your plans in an organized timeline with our short-term goals to complete before, um, before our winter break, as well as our long-term goals to complete before the end of the school year. So um, at the end of the day, you and your team, you and your team will have the opportunity to sit down and with our help um, actually plot out your projects using this worksheet to set your goals and write up your timeline. And um, once you have a paragraph or two written, written up about your plans, you'll have the basic outline of your climate action plan. So some tips to keep in mind during your presentation, I'm sorry, during your brainstorm and discussion later today, um, try to assign a note taker to keep track of the different um, directions the conversation develops in. Uh, pay attention to the little earth symbols at the bottom of the page to find helpful tips and tricks throughout the worksheet. Um, and keep in mind the step up, step down rule. And you guys have probably heard this rule before. Um, so to ensure that everyone is participating equally in group discussion, um, if you are someone who adds a lot to the conversation, uh, pay attention to who is not contributing as frequently and try to make sure that their voice is heard by stepping back and providing an opportunity for others. And then if you are someone who tends to um, listen to others more, make sure that you um, step up by adding your thoughts to the group discussion as well. And while you don't necessarily have to get into the specifics, um, start thinking about the logistics of actually carrying out your plan, such as funding, um, how you will monitor and measure your success in, um, over the school year, as well as your individual long-term goals that you would like to complete before you graduate, whenever that may be. Um, but again, we have a limited um, time today, so we're really just going to work to get the basic outline um, of your climate action plans down to provide some, gui some guidance as your projects develop. So does anyone have any questions so far? <coughs> okay, so I know that for some, um, putting the prospect of putting these actions together and carrying them out over the school year um, may seem pretty daunting. And I wish I could tell you all not to worry about it and to just focus on the daily troubles of being a kid in our society today. Um, but because you are all here, um, each and every one of you already understands the state of emergency we are in. And we knew that the alternative to showing up today was sitting in the classroom and preparing for a future that we might never get to see and a future that is currently being taken away from us. So we are here today to learn what we can actually do to make a difference. So um, this year, our climate action plans are gonna look a little different because our theme is pretty unique. Um, so that means, yeah, you're just gonna get as creative as possible. And um, so tell us a little bit about how art connects to climate change and climate activism is Extinction Rebellion's Emily Dropkin. And um, I think Colleen, are you introducing her? Perfect, okay. So we welcome back Emily. She came um, to our past climate summit and we just loved her so much we wanted her back again. Um, Emily is um, a writer, educator, and an activist. Um, she's the director of data planning um, and evaluation for the Head Start and Early Childhood Learning Programs um, and Community Action in the Pioneer Valley. Um, she spends a lot of her time writing and coordinating Extinction Rebellion in Western Massachusetts. And her writing blends speculative and literary traditions to explore human responses to climate emergency. Um, she's going to be doing a, a little bit of a workshop this afternoon, and she'll talk to you a little bit about that. But we welcome Emily back. Thank you. All right, I'm going to start out with some of my, my visual aids from a recent action.
<laughs> so, <laughs> um, just a, just sort of a starting point for our climate action can be serious and also funny and also creative. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for having me back. Uh, my name is Emily Dropkin. My pronouns are she, her, um, and as was said, one of my uh, part-time jobs at the moment, more or less, is uh, coordinating Extinction Rebellion Western Massachusetts. Um, and so for those of you who don't know much about Extinction Rebellion, I'll do a little bit of introduction to that first. So Extinction Rebellion originally uh, arose in the UK about not quite three years ago, um, it, growing out of other environmental movements, other activist movements. Um, and that October, on, around Halloween, they had their first giant demonstration in London. They came back six months later in April and shut down a bunch of bridges for an entire week. And at the end of that, the UK Parliament declared a state of climate emergency. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a really exciting moment and it drew in activists all over the world um, by that Already before the April Rebellion, rebels were starting to meet in Boston, and our chapter here in Western Massachusetts started that spring, bless you. Um, and today there are over 1,200 chapters in 84 countries. Um, and anytime you want to, you can go on Twitter or wherever and you can see people protesting under the symbol uh, from Ghana and Hong Kong and Chile and all over the US. Um, and so wherever you are, there's probably a chapter too. Um, Extinction Rebellion makes four demands in the United States. There are three that are international. The first is a demand to tell the truth, that governments and the media need to be honest about the state of the emergency that we're in and cover it continuously. Second, that we need to act now, that we need to reach carbon uh, neutrality by 2025, that we really don't have any time to waste. The third is that the decisions that are made, you know, we've been relying on governments to do this work for decades and they have not done it. They have not regulated industry. They have not uh, recognized the scale of the problem that we're facing and tried to make a difference. And so we really, the third demand is about what in the UK is called a citizen's assembly, which is this idea fundamentally that the decisions that are made should be led by groups of people in the community who know what needs to be done because we don't trust the government to do it all by themselves. Um, and in the United States, a fourth demand was added around the idea of environmental justice, that we need to recognize and make amends for histories of injustice um, in environmental justice communities where pollution and other damage has most impacted people of color in our country and indigenous communities um, and recognizing that as we rebuild, um, we, we need to use a justice lens in all of that work. That demand is actually much longer than that and has many more details and you can read it <laughs> online. Um, there are three sort of fundamental values behind the work that we do in Extinction Rebellion here and internationally. And the first of them that was the newest to me when I started out is this idea of regenerative culture. This idea, the way that it, it makes sense to me is this idea of saying, you know, if we're gonna do this work, we believe that we can make a difference in this, in the climate crisis. And we believe that on the other side of the climate crisis, we'll still be here. Our children and grandchildren will still be here. And if we can imagine that world we want to think about what are the values of that world? How do people relate to each other? How do people relate to the natural world? And then we want to take those values and live them in our movement this whole way through. That this isn't going to be a movement based on how we've always been doing things in our own lifetimes, because how most of government has happened and leadership has happened in the last couple decades or centuries has gotten us to this point. And so it's a way of really reframing what are our values going to be and how do we live them now. And we'll talk more about that in the workshop later. Um, the second thing that's a big idea in, in Extinction Rebellion is nonviolent direct action, which says, you know, we're not going to commit any violence, but, you know, 
we might sit down in a road and refuse to move. We might, uh, some people recently got naked in front of news headquarters in New York City um, to, to make a point. Saying, you know, we believe that this is so important that we will risk arrest and we will risk our freedom because we think that that will convey the scale and the urgency of this problem to the other people around us. And the third real value is this idea of creativity. Um, when I first um, got involved in XR, which I'll tell you about in a minute, I remember one of the one of the visuals that I saw going around in that April rebellion, which was already international at that point, was a picture of some rebels in France and they had built um, a set of nooses and they were standing with their heads in the nooses and they were standing on blocks of ice. And to this day, it sticks with me because that visual is so powerful and such a statement without any words of how some people are behaving about the situation that we're in. Um, and so there really is this power in visual art and written art, as you'll talk about later, um, to really get people's attention and to get to those people who, you know, aren't going to sit and read a 4,000 page IPCC study, but might watch a movie and might read a book and might, you know, look at a piece of art and start to understand what it is that's happening. So the way that I actually got involved was about my own creative work. I had been, I was studying at UMass. I was getting a master's degree in creative writing and I was working on a novel that I'd been writing for a few years that was about climate change. And I'd been doing a lot of research and I'd been working and working and the structure of the book was that these five or six different characters were all in different parts of the country and eventually they would converge on the same place and someone, one of them would save the day. And I was writing and I was writing and I did not know who was going to save the day or how. I had not figured out the ending. And I finally reached a point where I said, you know, this is, this is a novel about climate change. It can't be this hero's journey arc. We can't have a single person who's going to overcome their personal obstacles and then everything will be great. Then they can save the day for the rest of us. Just like we can't all wait around and assume that someday Elon Musk is going to, you know, fix the problem and nobody else will have to deal with the climate emergency. And so I ended up totally restructuring the book so that it was one woman at several different points in her life um, who eventually the only real scale that she acts on is when she realizes that she's surrounded by other people who were there and who are also ready to act with her. Um, and so I'd written that book. It had probably taken me three years longer than that. And I submitted it for my thesis in March of 2019. And in April, I watched all the footage of the rebellion. And I realized that I had written this entire book into believing that communal action is the only thing that's going to move us forward. And so I said, okay, well, if collective action is it, I will do it. <laughs> and I joined Extinction Rebellion. Um, and here I am more than two years later, um, still working in this group. Um, a long time ago for me, um, my last semester in college, I decided I would take geology because I had never studied geology. Seemed like it would be interesting. And on the, the first day of class, my professor at Amherst said, um, you know, she said, welcome. I'm so glad you're all here for introduction to geology. And for those of you who are freshmen and sophomores, I really hope that you'll consider majoring, majoring in geology. You might find it really interesting. And then she said, and for those of you who are senior humanities majors, I'm sorry, it's too late. <laughs> um, and so when I was teaching creative writing during my master's, I would always say to my students, but don't worry, it's not too late. You can be a writer at any point in your life. It doesn't matter when you start. It doesn't matter if you've got formal training. And I would say the same is absolutely true of being an activist. Whatever you're choosing to do, whatever your background is, you can step into this work where it makes sense for you. And the other part of that is that the climate emergency connects to everything we love. And as you look ahead to your studies in college and whatever career you're choosing, you might choose to be an environmental scientist. But there's really no field of study you could choose that isn't going to connect to the things that you love. 
If you love history, if you love teaching children, if you love writing or making art, or you love engineering, all of those things are going to be affected by the coming crisis. And all of those fields of study will give you skills that will be useful to your collective community in the crisis ahead. So whatever your passion is, pursue it. Because coming back to that idea of regenerative culture, having that thing that you love is part of what will help you process all the emotions that come up with this work and find your place in it. And you'll have that love to rely on as we face what really can be scary and disruptive and hard about dealing with climate change. Uh, I've got just a couple things to add to that before I, I hand you off to the next person. Um, one of them as you start to think about your creative projects this week is to really think about scale. I think this is probably something that's already come up in your planning process, but there's a difference in terms of impact between acting alone, between recycling the bottles that you yourself use, and convincing your entire school to recycle. But then there are levels above that. How can we you know, reach out to our state leadership? How can we pursue statewide or countywide legislation that's going to change behavior? How can we change the corporation's behavior that are creating the bottles in the first place? There are some countries in Europe where they've um, started, instead of having people uh, have to recycle, there are actually regulations that require the companies to recycle, and they have changed the packaging they use when it is on them to pay for the consequences. Um, so just in general, think about how, how expansive can your impact be, because acting alone is not going to do it. This idea of carbon footprint was an ad campaign paid for by BP, the gas company. They have convinced us that we should act individually at this small level and that that will do the trick because they don't want to have to do the work. Uh, which, which is sort of the last point I have to make, which is that you have power and you have access to power. You have access to your school leadership, to your school district leadership, to people who maybe you, certainly your parents, have voted to elect at the state and local and state and national levels. And so you don't have to start necessarily in your own household if that's not the scale that will have impact. You can really start much bigger um, because that's, that's really where we need to be acting at this point in the crisis when we know how fast it's approaching. Um, related to that, I just want to tell you about one action that Extinction Rebellion has coming up. So starting on Halloween and running for about two weeks, there's an international climate conference taking place in Dublin where the UN is meeting to hash out their next set of country level commitments or whatever they think they're gonna do that's gonna have some impact. And very little attention is being paid to it in this country and many others. Um, and so Extinction Rebellion, on those two weekends that the conference is happening, October 30th and 31st and November 6th and 7th will be in four different towns. I think it's Greenfield, Northampton, Holyoke and Amherst on those four dates doing uh, public readings of the latest IPCC report and having a die in. And so we'll just invite people to either join us on the day or sign up in advance and read a few pages of the report aloud and let yourself feel the reality of what it's telling us about how serious this situation is. Um, and then pass the mic and take turns making our voices heard, raising the real science in our communities. Um, we invite people to wear black or morning clothes. Um, we'll probably have our red brigade with us um, who are performance artists of a sort. Um, there are many ways to get involved and I'll, I'll send around uh, later. I've got a clipboard with uh, the, the web page where you can learn more and you can sign up for our newsletter if you want. Um, but if you're interested, I hope you'll join us. And if you're not local, I hope that you'll find the XR chapter wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. That was amazing. So um, before our next speaker, we're going to take a quick break for snack while we get set up. 
um, just a reminder, because I don't think we mentioned this before, there are QR codes on each of your tables, and that leads to the website with a lot of just general information, as well as some more cat materials, if you want to take a look at that um, during our snack break. And yeah, we'll be right back in about five minutes or so. on? I can't tell. Hello? Leo. We need Leo with our tech support. I think maybe. 
Hello? Leo. Leo. <laughs> yeah. Testing. Okay. All right. So, our next speaker is Lynn Bowmaster. And Lynn is someone that when we first started talking about the idea of creative climate action within our planning team, um, I immediately thought of Lynn. Um, I have been a student of Lynn's since I was eight and I have known her my whole life. She is a writer who takes inspiration from nature and her community. And she is one of the many reasons that I myself want to be a writer someday. Um, Lynn is a painter and a published poet. She has been hosting writing workshops for over 23 years now out of her home in Western Mass. Um, and as a participant of her workshop, I have witnessed Lynn's magic firsthand, and I am so excited that we all get to hear from her today as well. So Lynn, thank you so much. I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay, awesome. Hi, everybody. I get to take my mask off. Let's see. Can you hear me on this microphone? I'm not used to using microphones, so is that good? Is it better? Good. Seems okay. You can call out to me and tell me when you can't hear me, or I'll be able to hear when it's making a buzz, I imagine. Anyway, I'm Lynn Bowmaster, and I run a program called Woven Word Young Writers. We run writing workshops for writers from 7 to eight, 18 years old. And I'm so happy to have Morgan and Ollie here because they've been in writing workshop for a long time. And it's a very powerful space to explore your own writing voice. So I'm kind of excited to talk about it in the context of climate because what could be more important than that, right? Uh, and that's why you're all here. Uh, before I ran writing a uh, woven word, Young Writers I actually was a community organizer for about 20, 25 years, and I worked for Clean Water Action and Massachusetts Fair Share, which you probably don't know what it is because it's kind of not around in a major way now, but it's a cool name, huh? Fair Share. And also the National Campaign Against Toxic Hazards. So I have a lot of experience with actually organizing I was so happy to hear Emily talking about like being in the street moving it to scale thinking of something creative to call to the emergency that we are in but I've been asked just up here to talk about words and the power of writing as an expression so I've sort of prepared remarks and then scribbled them all out so here we go um, I thought it would be really cool to do something that we do in our workshop a lot, which is to start with a word brainstorm because it's a really cool writing prompt. And here we are in a totally overwhelming crisis. So let's just go down to like a few words. Um, I have a broken leg, by the way, <laughs> and it's healing, so I might have to go sit down. I just saw my crutches over there, so that's what the deal is with that. Anyway, getting over to what we were about to do. So what I would like to ask you to do right now, without really raising your hand, you can just call it out, um, is to call out words. And let's start with nouns. And I would like to ask you to call out nouns that just come to your mind that have to do with the climate crisis. And when Morgan says it back and writes it down, it means it got written down there. But I'd also like to ask you, if you have something to write down with and you're taking careful notes, um, write down this word list because this is going to be a cool word list, OK? So without further ado, does everyone understand? Just call out a noun that you think relates to the crisis we're in with the climate. Pollution? I can't spell it all the time. <laughs> and belt it out. Pollution. And don't wait. Go. Soil. What? Soil. 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 You just let me know if you didn't get something. That'll be, that'll be how it goes. OK. Trees. Awesome. Carbon. Carbon. Rivers. 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 Methane. Methane. Urgency. Urgency. Ozone. What? Fire. Fire. Weather. Weather. Extreme. Extreme. Okay. No, no, you're. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
No, no, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> This is a concept. Okay, anything else? What, what else is going on with our climate? Water. Water. Blood. Floods. Compost. Compost. Extinction. Extinction. Agriculture. 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 Fossil fuels. What? Biden. Joe Biden. Joe Biden. Ice. Ice. Regeneration. Regeneration. Exacerbation. Exacerbation. Renewable energy. Renewable energy. I can't, sorry. <laughs> no, what's the problem, Morgan? <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, great. Let's go on to some verbs. Let's take some action. What do you think? Oh, we're exhausting her. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> Wait, okay. Uh, verbs. Act. Yeah. Act. Act. Protest. Clean. Clean. Unite. What? Unite. Unite. Recycle. Recycle. Agree. 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 What? Change. Change. If I if I'm saying it back, I've heard you. Change. Compromise. Compromise. Grow. Grow. Discuss. Discuss. Fight, educate, educate. Reduce. reduce, change, Re change. change. what? Change. Change okay. I, we got change. Okay. Right. All right. <laughs> okay. Great. Let's go on. This is totally awesome. So, we have an awesome list. And, um, of course, this is one of the awesome things to do when you're starting to write about something. It's just to do like a word brainstorm, just do a brain dump, right? So we've just done a collective brain dump. And one word that I want to put on there is rise. Rise up, okay? So that kept coming up when I was thinking about these comments. That's why I think, as a verb, let's get it there, okay? Um, so... In Woven Word, Woven Word is based on a really important principle coming out of another really cool organization, the Amherst Writers and Artists. But it's that there's power in your voice. And a writer is a person who writes, OK? It's not like the most famous writer in the world. It's not you're a writer. You go to school every day, you write. And that's your voice, and when you're acting and dancing, that's your voice too, and dancing. When you're rebelling and you're making up your poster, that's another kind of voice. But in writing, there's the writer's voice. And everyone has their own voice. And it comes from who you are, from the kitchen table, from grandmother. It's powerful. I always want to cry when I talk. Oh, I cry a lot in writing workshop. That, that's cool. OK, so anyway, power your voice. We need to make sure it's not silenced, okay? So here we go. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, so a poem is one of the most powerful kinds of uh, expression you can do. So I want to talk about poetry first. So let's go with Neruda, because Neruda is like Pablo Neruda is. Who knows Pablo Neruda here? Awesome. Well, he's kind of like a mantra and woven word, you know? So. Uh, here's a quote from Pablo Neruda. What did the tree learn from the earth to be able to talk with the sky? And I am everybody, and every time I always call myself by your name. So awesome. Uh, that's Pablo Neruda. I mean, there's a lot to find out about him. Uh, but he has a lot to say about a lot of issues. He was an activist his whole life, and he was a poet. He also was a diplomat. He also went and protected refugees. He picked them up from Spain after Franco took over and moved them to Chile on, an, on a boat. So he was an activist, like you are. Uh, so the poet around us and in you, that's what we need to connect with. 
in order to get out on the street with Emily, right? Awesome. So I thought a really cool thing to do here would be to uh, raise our voices to do something spontaneous. And this just came up when I heard you all in your animal groups, okay? So how about if every animal group gets up and makes your animal call, which you probably don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with this table. Say your animal name and everybody make up the call. Stand up, rise up. <laughs> your table, what's the animal? Okay, all right, quiet everybody but the honey badgers, okay? Honey badgers, rise up. Rise up, you don't know what a honey badger sounds like. All right. Now rise up and make your call that you think is a honey badger call. One. Oh, very good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, honey badgers. Who are you guys? This table here. You. Okay, porcupine, stand up. All right, now, at the count of three, let's hear what porcupines sound like when they're calling up. One, two, three. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, the table behind that table. What, who are you? Oh, yes, mycelium. This is going to be fabulous. Okay, mycelium. One, two, three. <laughs> they make noise, though. Haven't you read the book? Okay, all right. One, two, three. <laughs> awesome. All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. This table right here. Who are you? Dragonfly. All right. One, two, three. <laughs> okay. And even if you think you make a quiet vo noise, you could just pretend that you are a mi million dragonflies walking down the street in Washington, D.C., making a noise. Okay, so who are you? Okay, pandas, get up. Very favorite thing in Washington, D.C. Okay, so now we're going to hear the panda noise. One, two, three. Very good. Great. Great. And, and you there. <laughs> Who are you? Raccoons. Raccoons. Oh, yeah. Okay, so one, two, three raccoons. All right. Awesome. All right. You are. <laughs> okay, you are a raptor, right? What's the first word? Velosa. Velociraptors. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good job, everybody. Okay, so now we got our animal calls and we have risen up. Part of the reason. Part of the reason why I went to that is that um, Rise Up just kept coming up for me in this. So getting back to poetry, poetry is, this is a quote from Paul Engel. It's ordinary language raised to the nth power and it's boned with ideas, nerved with blood and emotion and held together by the delicate, tough skin of words. So find your poet. We need your poet every day in thinking about the climate, remember that you have this core voice and it is your job to unleash it. And one of my favorite quotes about this comes from the dancer, Martha Graham. And it is, there's a vitality, a life force, a quickening. Does anyone know what a quickening is? Well, it's when a mother first feels life force in the belly, that's the quickening. Okay, there's a vitality, a life force, a quickening that's translated through you into action and there's only one of you in all time. The expression's unique 
And if you block it, it will never exist. So it will be lost and the world won't have it. So it's your job to find that voice. And that's true in all your artistic expression, okay? It's not your business to determine how good it is or compare it to someone else. And one of the problems in our life journey in education is that we're taught that all the time, right? But it's your obligation to find it and free it. It's your business to keep it yours clearly and directly to keep the channel open. So this is Martha Graham teaching people to dance, right? It's your job to keep that channel open. So please think of that with your voice, your writing voice. So poetry is raw and honest and it's powerful. And that's what the world needs. And that's why we're so lucky that we're now going to hear a poem from Morgan Brown McNeil, who was a finalist for the Youth Poet Laureate of Northampton. And she is now going to read us a poem she wrote about climate change. And take it. Can you come? I, if I have to move, it's a big deal. OK. OK. <laughs> um, so this poem. This poem is called How Can You Sleep? And it's kind of an anger poem. Um, so, yeah. Can everybody hear? Yeah. Okay, great. This generation has been left with a situation we can't situate. You try to abbreviate, but we can understand you. We take a stand and you say that we should all lie down. We're going to drown. Our voices are shoved to the ground. You can't wait for us to grow up, to show up and fix the mess. But when we show up, it will be too late. Do you need me to enunciate? You cannot wait for us to alleviate the pain. You look at us with disdain. You claim it's not you we should blame. But we understand now that you betrayed us. We mistrust the grandparents we never met. Your conscience is wet with guilt. How can you sleep when you know what you've built? You've torn the quilt of generations. You say there's limitations. You say we need to build stronger foundations before we act. It's all an act. You say some boring facts, but when you subtract the problem, when you start to crack the column, we know you don't care. You want to bring down the house, but it's our house. Most of you will be dead when the world is one big drought. So don't doubt that we will make sure you drown, but first, you won't sleep. Awesome. We usually ask poets to read their poems twice in woven words. So I am asking Morgan to read it one more time, loud and slow. Okay. Okay? How can you sleep? This generation has been left with a situation we can't situate. You try to abbreviate, but we can understand you. We take a stand and you say that we should all lie down. We're going to drown. Our voices are shoved to the ground. You can't wait for us to, sh to grow up, to show up and fix the mess. But when we show up, it will be too late. Do you need me to enunciate? You cannot wait for us to alleviate the pain. You look at us with disdain. You claim it's not you we should blame, but we understand now that you betrayed us. We mistrust the grandparents we never met. Your conscience is wet with guilt. How can you sleep when you know what you've built? You've torn the quilt of generations. You say there's limitations. You say we need to build stronger foundations before we act. It's all an act. You say some boring facts, but when you subtract the problem, when you start to crack the column, we know you don't care. You want to bring down the house, but it's our house. Most of you will be dead when the world is one big drought, so don't doubt that we will make sure you drown, but first, you won't sleep. Okay, it's your house. Thank you, Morgan. That was awesome. Can people hear me still? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So, I wanted to quote from Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Had anyone ever heard of her? <laughs> uh, we don't have time to sit on our hands and, as our planet burns. For young people, climate change is bigger than election or re-election. It's life or death. Okay, one of the reasons why I want to quote from her is because of her voice, right? She does not mess around. 
You think she edited that four times? No. <laughs> she is telling you. We don't have time to sit on our hands as our planet burns. You know, what better line could you write in a poem? So that is AOC. And you could probably tell me her life story, but I think she was a waitress, she was a bartender, but she's got the voice, right? And now she's a congresswoman. And what does she do? She goes and occupies the chamber outside of the Speaker of the House's door. The Sunrise Movement. She brings people out, and it isn't just her. It's the people who build it. But that is one of the reasons why I wanted to quote from her, because she understands the power of that raw voice. So do not let people silence you. It's very important. Um, and uh, this is a very, very old quote from a poet from long ago, Voltaire. Man argues, nature acts. OK? We're in that. And we are living in this climate plan that you're making and we are making together in that context. And so we need to act. We need to rise up. So I hope when you go home today or you come to the writing workshop this afternoon, you take these and you just let it rip. You write a raw poem. Write it in a stream of consciousness about what is happening and if you're mad. And it does use specifics, use details. It doesn't have to be all up in just the inner emotions. It is what is happening to the planet. But let it rip, OK? Because that's what changes things. We cannot silence our voices now. So anyway, moving on. And tell me how much time we have, because now we're going over to story. What? I think it's around 11. Well, what time do I need? Do we need to stop this? <laughs> okay, good. So a story that I think you all know something of that I really want to use as one example is the story of Rachel Carson. And how many people have studied or written a book report on Rachel Carson? <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, uh, here's some of the things that struck me when I was looking at about uh, Rachel Carson. First of all, she is an incredible poet, okay? Here's before she was ever known for Silent Spring or ever even thought of writing anything like Silent Spring. She was writing about the ocean. She was in love with the ocean and she wrote, who has known the ocean? Neither you nor I, with our earthbound senses, know the foam and the surge of the tide that beats over the crab hiding under the seaweed of his tide pool home, or the lilt of the long, slow swells of mid-ocean where shoals of wandering fish prey and are preyed upon and the dolphin breaks the waves to breathe the upper atmosphere. That's Rachel Carson. So. She had written a whole trilogy of books about the ocean, um, the sea, oh, I'm to, no, I'm to, the sea around us. She won the National Book Award for the sea around us, and she, her eyes were focused on the ocean. And she'd written three books, and um, she was a marine biologist, so she also was a researcher, right? But Rachel Carson, like everyone, has a life story. So tragedy struck. And her niece, who she loved, died. And she ended up adopting a five-year-old boy. So all of a sudden, she's a mother. And her attention turned away from the ocean. And in that turning, she sees these other issues. And that's when she learns about DDT and pesticides and the fact that there are corporations out there spraying these pesticides all over the place for mosquito control. And she thinks, this doesn't make any sense because she's a scientist and she's a deep thinker, right? So she says, in nature, nothing exists alone, right? Why is it called a pesticide? Like, 
that it means it kills a pest and that sounds great to someone who wants to kill the pest right but she's not stopping there so she says can anyone believe it's possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the surface of the earth without making it unfit for life so she's asking that question and so we count on our gut that place that poetry comes from the place that your rebellion is coming from and she begins to talk about it and research and guess what happens a bunch of people start to send her information so a grassroots movement that doesn't know each other probably is mailing things to rachel carson because she's famous because she won a book award for this beautiful poetry voice right so even though she doesn't know about she doesn't even focus on the land as a scientist normally she's making these connections and she's not backing down right so uh the problem with ddt was um here we are at arcadia i'm sure there's so many people could explain it better than me but to cut to the chase um, that chemical ending up in the environment and going up the food chain to predators meant that the eggs of bald eagles and osprey were thinning and then they weren't hatching and so the generations of birds were not continuing and they were totally a danger of going extinct right so um with people helping her she began to assemble this book it was going to be about pesticides it didn't have a name right in fact i think some people thought maybe silent spring was sort of a corny name right but what did silent spring mean there might not be bird song and so they did call it silent spring and before it was even published um the new yorker magazine had commissioned her to write about the issue so sometimes not just the writer but the writer community takes its role on to help and help this rise up and so rachel carson's articles you know naming this issue she was really framing it and as usual she was not alone she was not the only one there were other people there were scientists but people understood she had this power it was power the eloquence of her poetry um so even before silent spring came out and she had really prepared to be attacked on it because guess what there's big money behind it there were chemical companies even before it came out they were preparing to attack her in every way they even went as far as someone called her oh she's very attractive and she's unmarried so therefore she must be a communist <laughs> okay does that sound kind of familiar now every time someone is making an impact they're a socialist um so these things were being said even back then but the point is silent spring came out you know to rave review and then this very well-known literature magazine the new yorker which wasn't known across the whole country they turned it into a series so that it would then come out week by week by week in these magazine subscriptions all over the country and that was power and then it got named the book of the month i think on a national book of the month it just took off it was right the corporation's worst nightmare and then what happened ddt was banned and so when you see the bald eagle up there you know it makes a difference to speak out so that's that's like important it's also considered that it launched the environmental movement in some ways and it helped to pass many of these other fundamental national laws the clean air act the clean water act um the endangered species act these are things that while we think government you know doesn't do enough on it and that's true it's also true that the fundamental laws of environmental policy are what protect endangered species and what have made the Connecticut River so you can swim and what have taken um smog causing pollutants down in the air beyond uh you know you weren't alive when you could drive through Pittsburgh in the daytime with your headlights on you know 
because of the smog. Um, so, you know, it makes a difference and the writing makes a difference. So I just want to tell that story. There are so many stories to tell about people who wrote and pursued, but the point is actually telling stories is very important. It's actually part of organizing. So that's another thing is don't ever forget the power of the little story, your story of how you became involved. It's important, okay? Um, so should we wrap this part up, do you think? Or do you want to, yeah. Yes. Um, okay, well, let me just come to one last part, okay, if we're, if we're cutting, we're closing in. I have a whole section on writing letters to the editor, okay? We're not going to get into it here, but I'll have a writing a letter to the editor example in the writing workshop time. And I want to say that another woven word writer, Maddie Raymond, is a really good example of this. I have, I don't know, does anybody here know Maddie Raymond? Awesome! Okay. And so Maddie um, started to write letters to the editor. Again, she knew the power of story. She didn't cut down the power of her own voice as she told it. And she's had many letters to the editor published. She recently had an op-ed that the Hampshire, Daily Hampshire Gazette asked her to write. And now she writes a monthly column um, in the Greenfield Re Recorder. So some part of Maddie's writing here. Um, but we aren't gonna, I guess, read it right now. Um, but it was on the importance of white people who have privilege to practice anti-racism and to learn about it. And she starts by telling her own story of privilege. And then she thinks about what that means to other people. And she writes it to the editor, the editor, and then she calls everyone to get involved. So writing letters to the editor is something that we can all do. And one of the things I want to point out that's really powerful about them is that they're small. They're a small writing exercise. They're one of the most well-read things in magazines or newspapers. And the thing is, politicians, OK, elected officials, read the letters to the editor. They monitor the letters to the editor because they know other people are reading it. And it's like a temperature taking for the congressional office. And we have got to move that Congress. We have to rise up and get that Congress taking some action, right? And so letters to the editor is something that you can do. It's a place that you can start. And another point I wanted to make about it is that one of the reasons it's so powerful is that politicians know that senior citizens always read letters to the editor. And you know why that's important? Because senior citizens always vote. Okay? They vote. And voting is what makes a difference. You may think that Congress is not worth paying attention to, but again, without the Clean Air Act, without the uh, Clean Water Act, without the major tenants that could go on of our environmental policy, we can't, you know, we would go backwards further. And we need action on climate change. And so we need to be the people who vote. And you may not be old enough to vote yet. But when you meet people who are like, oh, it's only worthwhile to be in the street, um, which is a really important place to be, OK? It's a really important place to be. But you need to remember that we have got to move this election game. Um, and so we could talk about that all day. But I just leave you with that. One of the powers of your voice is also your vote. So please don't squander it, and don't let people around you squander it, OK? So thank you very much for your time. And we're going to have a writing workshop if people want to come to that. Could we have one more round of applause for amazing speaker? Before our next presentation,
presentation, we're just going to do a quick um, shakedown for us, those theater kids out there. You might know what this is. So everyone, please stand up. Make sure you have a little room. Just something I know we've been sitting for a long time. All right. So, shake down. You're going to shake your right hand. You're going to shake your left hand. You're going to shake your right foot. You're going to shake your left foot. No, this is not the hokey pokey. Then you're going to shake your whole body. So we're going to shake for eight counts, six counts, four counts, two counts. And then on the last one, at the very last shake, you can go like, ha, ah! or maybe your animal call. Just some pose and just let it rip, some noise, whatever comes is great. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 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 One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 One, two, three, four. 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 One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, 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 one. Oh! Yes! I love it. I love it. That could be. Let's see that there. Beautiful. Oh, that's great. Thank you. 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 So, now that we've had a little moment to move, I am so excited to introduce our next presenter, Rahul Roy. Not only is he an incredible musician, guitarist, composer, he has also been an educator for over 30 years. I'm incredibly lucky to have him as one of my teachers. Um, Rahul is an amazing musician, um, also an amazing speaker, and I'm super grateful that we can have him today talking about music and the way we can use it to amplify our voices. So without further ado, please have a warm welcome to Rahul Roy. Wow. Thank you, Natalia. That introduction was so heavy, I was wondering who she was talking about for a minute. I was like, where is this guy? Um, hi, how are we doing today? Everybody okay? Um, so, what I've been doing for most of my life is improvising. And improvisation in music is something that, you know, has been taught, it's been learned, it's been talked about. Um, but the truth about improvisation is that we all do it all the time, every day. Um, whether we do it in music or whether we do it in communication is a matter of the medium and it's a matter of our circumstances. So when Natalia was kind enough to invite me to, to speak with you today, I had plenty of time to prepare things and write things and think about things, but in my world that's cheating. You know what I mean? Like, that's a no-no. Yeah, you know, you can prepare something and come out and quotes and so forth, and it'll probably bore you to tears. I didn't want to do that. You're probably bored already with lots of things that go on in your lives. And I thought, well, these are young people. These are our future leaders. Actually, you're the leaders already. And so I wanted to share, if I might, what I'm seeing from you and what I'm reflecting on what you may be seeing from us. When I say us, I mean old folks, um, like me. So first thing I wanted to talk about is these things. You guys have these phones? How many of you have phones? Show of hands. And you thought slavery had been abolished. Turn these off, not today, not now. Just turn them off for a week and your lives become unlivable. That's what slavery means. That's the definition of slavery. You choose, we choose what we do with our lives, right? You're here today, hopefully, 
not because you were coerced into coming here and listening to people talk about the environment. Hopefully you've got a stake in it. Hopefully you've got a vested interest in being here. Is there anybody who's here who doesn't have a vested interest in being here? Anybody? No, right? Same planet. Your planet, my planet, their planet. If there is a future, it belongs to them. We're custodians. We're visitors. Transients, all of us. Brought here by some mysterious force. If you believe in religion and if you follow religion, fine, that's okay. If you choose to believe those things, that's fine too. But if it's a belief, then by definition, what is it not? It's not what? It's not knowledge. If you believe something, it's not knowledge. What do I mean by that? Why do you believe anything? What's that based on? It's based on something that people call faith, maybe? Or sometimes it's about an indoctrination. Basically, it's a removal of ownership. It's what belief is. Or it's fear. You better do this or else, you know, somebody with a pointed head and red tail is going to come up and make your life pretty miserable. That kind of shit doesn't fly in my world. No. I've got to know it. And if I don't know it, then I simply say the truth, which is, I don't know. We're much better off with, I don't know, than I believe. And I'll tell you why. If somebody else is choosing to scare you into believing what they want you to believe, you've inhabited their world and they've hijacked yours. Is this your world? Yes, it is. Each and every one of us has a direct relationship with the cosmos. The divine, if it exists, exists within each and every one of us. I don't have the ability or the authority to tell you who or where we came from because I'm just like you. You have the same tools to access that information. Truth, right? Okay, so if that's the case, why do we have the kinds of problems that we have in the world? Power? Greed, sabotage, politics, it's an ugly world in many ways, but not completely. We also have the ability to make things beautiful every single day. Every single one of us chooses our reality. Okay, so what does that mean for me? For me, in my world, it means I wake, hopefully, I wake. And then I meditate. For me, meditation means I simply breathe and I listen to the sound of my breathing. Now, I'm not advocating this. I'm just telling you what my day looks like. On average, I start about 4 o'clock in the morning. I breathe. I think. I feel. And then I start playing music. If it's a nice day, fall, spring, summer, I go out and I play golf, sometimes. Sometimes I take a walk in a place like this. Sometimes I talk to my children or my girlfriend. Most often, I just look and stare and listen to the birds, to the trees, and thank my lucky stars that I get to enjoy them. I'm also very grateful to my ancestors that made it possible for me to be here, possible for me to enjoy this incredible bounty. But as I said before, I'm here temporarily, just like the rest of us. We're passing through. From where? Don't know. To where? Don't know. That's the truth. So, we got choices. What kinds of choices do we have while we're here? We can take a look around and we can embrace things as they are 
We can change them. We can move them. Well, how do we do those things? Well, first, we've got to start with one person. Anybody remember a great Michael Jackson tune called The Man in the Mirror? Remember that one? Great tune. Maybe we'll do it one day. Anyway, so you're there, you're looking at things, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, what kind of choice do I have today? Well, just a brief, brief discussion about wealth, because that controls this planet. And when I say wealth, I'm not talking about being rich. I'm not talking about a few million dollars in a family bank account. I'm talking about the kind of wealth where you've got 60 people in this country, 60, six zero, who own 80% of the wealth. Let me repeat that, 60, six zero human beings in America who own 80% of the wealth, 80%. Guess what? When they say yes, everybody around them and under them has no choice. That's not a democracy. People will tell you that this is a democracy, but I'm telling you that it's not a democracy. It's what we call an autocracy. It's ruled from the mighty dollar. Any benefits that we have are acquired by luck, good fortune, or the missteps of the greedy. I'm not here to tell you that it's a good thing. It's not. You know that already. But it's the way I see it. And so we have a choice. We can question it. We can change it. We can make sure that we don't become part of it. That much at least we can do. So. If somebody tells you they're going to pay you $15 an hour to be a part of the problem and you have to take a serious pay cut to be part of the solution, that's what it really amounts to. It's a personal choice. We're talking about the environment. We're talking about trees. We're talking about animals. We're talking about all of those things in general. But in particular, we're talking about you, yourselves, your families, your children, and mine. And so I have a vested interest in being here and talking with you. I don't know you, I've never met you before, but I genuinely care about what happens to you because our lives are intertwined. Whether we choose to think of it that way or not is a matter of what we've been exposed to, right? So that's the deal. So the next time you go on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the Kardashians, any of that stuff, just remember that that was created for you so that you can be distracted long enough to not concentrate on the problems. Because if you start concentrating on the problems with your genius, you will solve the problems. And if you solve the problems, that 80% of the wealth isn't going to stay with those 60 people. It's going to get redistributed to the people that need it, deserve it, and will make the changes that we are here talking about. Without that, it doesn't happen. I can sit here and talk to you till we're blue in the face. It's not going to change. The only thing that changes things in this world is money and power. And those are ugly words for people who live the romantic life. But that's the reality of the world we live in. If you're a person of color, if you're a woman, if you're a woman who's a person of color, if you're a trans person, if you're a gay person, if you're a religious minority, if you're a socioeconomic minority, you're in the majority. There's the irony. All of us, when put together, are the planet. But when you get divided up into little sections, 
you're easier to control and you're easier to program just like these things whether or not you leave here and plant a tree today or not isn't going to make a big difference to my grandchildren or yours it'll help but your reason for talking about why that's important and your reasons for choosing not to do some of the things that you think is worth doing with your lives that's a much bigger deal there's enough pain in the world and enough fear in the world and enough rubbish in the world to force us to think that the only happiness we're going to find is in this temporary distraction which fragments our life and gives us a false sense of temporary security bullshit you have within you and i have within myself the power to be the most happy human being that's ever lived i create my reality i create my choices where do i teach where do i work where do i walk what do i say whom do i speak to what do i eat what do i pay for what do i contribute to it's your world i'm going to end with a quote from one of my heroes i got several but i'm going to end with this information is not knowledge knowledge is not wisdom wisdom is not truth truth is not beauty beauty is not love love is not music and music is the best thank you so much for listening i love you very much peace music Here, one more round of applause for our amazing speaker. Thank you so much. All right, we are reaching to our last presentation of the day. This is a face we might have seen around. We have our amazing youth leader and collaborator, Morgan, who is going to be presenting um, on poetry. So, big round of applause for Morgan. Hello again. Um, this is a bit of a spontaneous presentation, so I apologize, but yes, anyway. Um, as you all know, my name is Morgan. My pronouns are they, them. Um, and I'm here to talk about poetry. I've been in love with literature forever, but my newfound love of writing and poetry is more recent. Um, Growing up, I was more naive than I am honestly comfortable sharing, but that naiveness, that not knowing or seeing or hearing, that was really, um, sorry. <laughs> that was really what drew me into climate action. Um, and I was determined to make 100% sure that no child in the world would ever have to, have to live with not knowing. I feel a little bit betrayed by my parents and by this system that taught me to fear being different and taught me to be naive and I'm here to talk about poetry. I'm here to talk about the future. I was a naive child, naive in my perspective and in my knowledge. I was late to realize that the world was dying, but my need to make a difference came to me when my love of writing did. To me, writing and specifically poetry are so interwoven with the future of our planet that the future and the future of our lives that sometimes I can't find the divide between them. I'm going to read another poem today that I wrote and it's called Toxic. This was also an anger poem. <laughs> um, we used to be younger than our future, but now it's the only thing we're taller than. It's a boombox of sounds, of voices. Their future rings loud and clear, but when we reach ours, it seems that the volume has turned itself down. Somehow there is no sound, but the drowned out cries of the loss of losing the lives of our own children. 
We don't have a plan. We don't even take a stand. But I must say, the big man in charge knows how to charge. We are making progress, but really it's just a disguise. Now we're just distressed when all that the world shows us are bright red lies. And the skies won't show us anything but what we want to see, a clear blue sea. But somehow it just keeps getting bigger. Maybe it's just me, but is the ocean getting taller? And maybe it's just me, but it seems that nobody really can be bothered. And now we're all drowning and the shouting's growing louder. It's all clamor and the banter of the future seems to be hidden in the pleading for our lives. But there's no mercy to be given. The story you've all rehearsed is what we've all heard before. Inside the deepest, darkest nooks, inside the deepest, darkest nooks, inside the world we've tried to build. But the building is now falling down into the sea, and we can't see because the fire is all that seems to be alive. It's spreading, making everything else die, and now it's all that we have left, the fire or the water, and now it's all that we regret. We could drown or we could burn. Both of them would hurt, but not as much as the pain we've all felt for the world we know we could have saved. Um, so I wrote this poem when I was, um, when I still kind of felt alone in trying to make a change and when I felt like there was nothing happening. Um, and standing here gives me so much hope that there are these people who are also trying to save the world, but there's still so far to go. And here, being here is just well, the first step. So thank you. Hello again. Um, so we are going to take a quick break, five minute break, um, to move around and then we're going to come back for lunch. So, see you soon. See you in five minutes.